Something that absolutely fascinates me is old dark rides, and there's certainly no short list of really interesting former attractions that I wish I could go back in time and experience. I've discussed the many former attractions of Universal Studios Florida, Epcot, and a variety of others that are all immensely intriguing. I'm even glad to see that Disneyland understands the importance of preserving and updating its many dark rides from its earlier years, allowing generations of guests to enjoy them while still preserving the spirit of the original iterations. Speaking of which, I've long had the idea of covering the classic dark rides of Germany's Phantasialand, many of which look suspiciously similar to what Disneyland had or currently does offer. Now, I've already covered Phantasialand before, giving my impressions on this small but ever-changing park that seems to be emerging as one of the best themed experiences in the world. Many of its additions over the last decade have been absolutely incredible, and it's a shame that not enough of my American audience is familiar with such a stunning place. With that being said though, like many early European theme parks, its history is very much inspired by the success of Disneyland, with many of its now defunct attractions clearly borrowing design elements from old Disneyland classics. For example, the park once sported a monorail known as the Phantasialand Jet, which operated from 1974 through 2008. I obviously don't need to tell you where they got the inspiration from. But while running a monorail through a theme park has become a pretty standard thing to do throughout the industry, the Phantasialand Jet did actually contain a peculiar dark ride portion that was added in 1983. When moving through the western section of the park, the monorail would move into a rock facade, and on the right side of the train, visitors would view a scene of an animatronic woolly mammoth that was being hunted by Neanderthals. This scene would then transition into a cave where you could see a few more figures roasting meat, tanning leather, and just doing other miscellaneous caveman things. Turning to the left side of the train, another prehistoric scene emerges, showcasing dinosaurs such as the Dimetrodon, Pterodactyls, and a Triceratops fighting a T-Rex. Just past them, you could view a Stegosaurus and what I believe is a lone Brontosaurus. Finally, it's a bit difficult to see on video, but I believe that there's a static figure of a T-Rex laying down, as if mortally wounded by its fight with the Triceratops. It's not a huge scene, but it's certainly interesting, looking suspiciously familiar to Disney's Ford's Magic Skyway, built for the 1964 New York World's Fair and featuring scenes of Neanderthals and dinosaurs. The inspiration isn't exactly subtle, and of course, if you're familiar with Disneyland, then you'll know that you can still see those same dinosaurs on the Disneyland Railroad still to this day. However, Phantasialand has a really interesting history of old and quirky dark rides that were clearly inspired by Disneyland, so I thought that it would be a more niche and less known topic to my audience that would probably be really interesting to cover. So with that being said, let's dive right into the weird and defunct dark rides of Phantasialand. By the way, if you've decided to stick with me this far into the video, you can do me a favor by hitting the like button. Like many European theme parks, Phantasialand maintained a Marchenwald or fairy tale forest from 1967 through 2007. Located in the quieter area of the park that loops around a lake, the fairy tale forest was a series of animatronic dioramas that portrayed the stories of various fairy tales, most of which were European. While not as interesting as Efteling's fairy tale forest, I do have to say that I am always interested in seeing stuff like this when parks do them, and even though I haven't been to Phantasialand, I am a bit disappointed that this no longer exists, because the lake area is otherwise pretty bare today. However, what also makes this area interesting is an extinct boat ride on the lake that opened in 1968, with the title that translates to Pirate Trip to Cartagena. The boat will start by taking the riders past a number of scenes, with the first being extremely familiar if you've ever been on the Jungle Cruise. Next, you'll encounter a crocodile that opens its mouth, and I think comes off much less perilous than intended. Before you enter the upcoming cave, 
riders will also be able to view a pretty sizable pirate ship on the lake. However, once you actually enter the structure itself, known as the Corsair Cave, you would encounter a number of scenes that obviously ripped off Pirates of the Caribbean, which is also quite impressive because that ride had only just opened to Disneyland one year prior. I don't know whether these scenes had any movement or not, because information is scarce, and I can only find three surviving photos, but I'm under the assumption that they probably did, at least to a limited degree. On emerging out of the Corsair Cave, Riders would encounter more elements obviously ripped from the Jungle Cruise, including a few hippos, a scene with what I believe are supposed to be baboons under a rock cover, and a tribal African man waiting to ambush the boat. The final portion of the ride takes the boat through jungle runs, although strangely enough, marketing at the time seemed to officially label this section as Atlantis. Mixing 19th century colonial exploration of Africa with 17th century pirates is already strange enough, so, yeah, this is Atlantis. Why not? Be sure to get a good look at the Atlantean elephants, and it wouldn't be a proper conclusion to the ride without a janky gorilla hiding in the brush. This attraction would close briefly and return in 1979 as Viking Boat Trip, using new Nordic longboats and replacing the pirates in the cave with, well, Nordic Vikings. It is worth noting that these figures do have a decent degree of movement to them, as a bit of video does fortunately exist, but I don't think this portion of the ride was designed very well. It's a lot of scenes, but not enough space to breathe between them, so it just comes off as a bit chaotic. It's also clear that a lot of former scenes that took directly from Pirates of the Caribbean were recycled for this version too, as evidenced by the jail scene with the dog holding the keys. I can't say that either version of this attraction seemed very cohesive or thoughtfully put together, but the novelty of blatantly ripping off Disneyland does certainly allow it to be an interesting attraction to learn about, and it would eventually close in 1999. Also located in the area around the lake was Dreadstone Castle, a horror-themed walkthrough that operated from 1972 through 2008. On entering the castle, visitors would encounter the first of five distinct scenes, starting with a mad scientist who appears to have passed out on a table in his lab. Someone can be heard knocking on the door, begging to be let in, and occasionally an ethereal head in a crystal ball would manifest, giving poetic advice that essentially amounted to letting go of one's own anger. The crystal ball didn't move or levitate like Madame Yoda in the Haunted Mansion, but the inspiration is still clear. The second scene consisted of a man in a portrait transforming into a werewolf, achieved simply through a lighting effect. Moving on to the third scene, three unsettling monks glide around a graveyard and chant as tombstones down below can be seen moving. It's clear that Fantasyland's old attractions often borrowed heavily from Disneyland, but in this scene, it's very clearly inspired by Efteling's spook slot. Continuing forward, the fourth scene consisted of a ghost playing an organ and a few ghostly ballroom dancers nearby achieved through a Pepper's ghost effect, and inspired by, you guessed it, the ballroom scene of the Haunted Mansion. Once the music from the organ stops, the ghosts disappear and a coffin is illuminated, with the lid opening and a vampire partially emerging and laughing forebodingly. The final scene appears to portray Lord Dreadstone himself as a stone figure, and the display seems to have changed a few times over the course of the attraction's lifetime. In some videos, the eyes appear to move, and in others, the statue is lit up and the mouth moves, I believe. Lord Dreadstone also leaves visitors with a message that seems to have changed over the years as well, but I think the general gist is that he states that collecting monsters and ghosts in the castle is his hobby. So far, I think the attractions we've explored have definitely been a bit strange, but the weirdness is also what makes them so interesting to me. However, things are about to get a whole lot stranger. In Berlin, the early 20th century themed area of the park that serves as its version of a Main Street USA, an attraction would open in 1977, the Klimbimski Monkey Theater. This terrifying show is clearly inspired by Disney attractions like America Sings and the Country Bear Jamboree, but mostly uses chimpanzees in its various musical acts. That being said, it does have a few bears in it, 
as well as a Bavarian and a French parrot that would introduce the show and banter between the performances, clearly inspired by the Enchanted Tiki Room. In terms of using chimpanzees for the performers, I think the show is clearly intended to be innocent, but my American sensibilities are tingling. Otherwise though, the show is notable for being the first to use electronic figures outside of the United States, but was surprisingly short-lived, only existing until 1983 when it was removed and sold to a park in the Netherlands where it would continue to run until 2003. With the show being so successful, Fantasyland would introduce a new show, the Tanakra Theater, which opened with the new themed land, Chinatown, in 1981. While a lot of information on what this show really was doesn't seem to exist, the premise does appear to be another musical review, hosted by a badger who acted as the conductor. It contained dancing fountains and various animatronics, including birds on a spinning mobile and singing Birds of Paradise, obviously again taken right from the Tiki Room. The show reportedly focused on Chinese myths featuring elements such as a Chinese lion, these figures which I believe may be warriors, and various dragons. There is also an old German couple near the audience that comments on the show, which does remind me quite a bit of Statler and Waldorf in Muppet Vision, but this show does predate that, so for once, it doesn't seem to be taking something from Disney. Well, other than these birds that remind me a bit of America Sings. Otherwise though, there are a lot of other interesting elements, such as these singing frogs, or this scene that focuses on various birds and has a peacock emerging out from a flamboyance of flamingos, reminiscent of something produced in a Golden Age Hollywood musical. Returning back to Berlin, with the closure of the Kombimsky Monkey Show, a replacement opened in the same year as the Star Parade, which is just as equally frightening. Yet again, another music show, this time the various performances would encompass different genres of music from around the world. Examples of this include a circus act, a scene based on famous French singer Muriel Mathieu, geese doing the can-can, a performance meant to emulate Nat King Cole, an elaborate waltz, which I believe is meant to represent Germany or Austria, and the show concludes with a samba piece during a carnival celebration in Brazil. There are plenty of other acts throughout, such as this lone Mexican figure playing the guitar, other performances that I believe are based around other famous singers, and most notable to me, just because he's so unsettling, is a dog that emulates Elvis. I mean, look at those hips go. The show itself was extremely complex and did have a remarkable number of different figures, existing as one of the park's star attractions until it closed in 1997. Just a quick mention, but the park also opened a simulator attraction in 1994 known as Galaxy, which was definitely Fantasyland's version of Star Tours. Oddly enough though, Fantasyland originally went to Universal, asking if they could license Back to the Future the ride, but obviously Universal declined. The queue itself is extremely similar to Star Tours, featuring a few animatronics, including a golden humanoid droid. Even the pre-show video just shamelessly copies what Star Tours was doing. As for the ride portion itself, it doesn't seem particularly noteworthy, but the premise is that riders are thrust into space to visit a theme park, but encounter trouble, saving an asteroid mining colony in the process. Galaxy ran until 2005 when it was then converted into Race to Atlantis, another generally unremarkable attraction that ran until 2016, until the building was demolished to make way for Rookburg. Since we're on the topic of space, but this section of the video is covering the park's shows, I do want to briefly highlight the queue for Space Center, Fantasyland's version of a space mountain, that operated from 1988 through 2001. The queue itself has a distinct futuristic aesthetic, and there seems to be a small diorama of a NASA rocket placed inside. However, most notable here are some animatronic aliens that aren't a huge part of the queue experience, but I do always like to point things out like this when I see them. Returning back to the park shows and finally concluding this portion of the video, I must also mention that the Tanakra Theater show was overhauled in 1994, renamed to Fire, Water, Light, and replacing the conducting badger with an odd robot figure as the host of the show. Many of the previous figures and scenes were changed, and the new show included elements like a witch who would interact with the fountains, or a mermaid who would sing to the fish. 
From my research, it's not clear to me what the purpose or story of the show was meant to be, but at least it's interesting, at least aesthetically. Perhaps the show could have been documented better if it had survived longer, but in 2001, the coaster known as the Grand Canyon Ride would catch fire, burning down a significant portion of Silver City and Chinatown, including the Tanakra Theater, which is the sad conclusion to the park's last remaining animatronic show. Moving on to the park's old dark rides, the first I would like to start with is the 1001 Nights Cable Car, which was a suspended ride system that took riders through scenes from the 1001 Arabian Nights. Having opened in 1970, you can see that the ride starts outside, moving through scenic gardens, and providing decent views of Berlin. A few minutes into the ride, your gondola will enter the mouth of a dragon, and riders will be transported into a cave system. Rounding the corner, a glimpse of the next scene can be viewed, and the gondola then briefly travels back outside. During this portion, there's a Buddha statue tucked into the rockwork, for whatever reason, and on re-entering the cave, you'll see the previous scene more clearly, which I believe is intended to be Sinbad, being carried by a rock from the story of the second voyage. Turning the corner, a scene on the left shows a caravan bringing gifts to the Sultan, and progressing further, the treasure appears to be in the process of being unloaded and weighed. The next scene brings riders past a cavern where men are fighting a cyclops, and the gondola then continues on to then revolve around a diorama of a lavish palace party. Coming to the final scene, men are depicted fighting a dragon in order to acquire its treasure. The ride then finishes out by moving past a sculpted cavern and returning to the station. While the content of the ride does take scenes from the Arabian Nights, I'm not too familiar with the material, and documentation of what these scenes are intended to be doesn't really seem to exist, so I'm not entirely sure what's meant to be referenced. The attraction was an iconic staple of the park for almost 40 years, and while simple in its execution, did seem like an enjoyable dark ride. In 2009, the ride was closed and demolished to make way for an expansion of Berlin. Silver City opened in 1978 as an area themed to the American West, and while its signature dark ride Silvermine was intended to open with it, the ride was delayed until 1984, after the opening of the adjacent Chinatown. Silvermine has riders board trains that run on a continuously moving chain, and while it's a different ride system from the Calico Mine ride at Knott's Berry Farm, it did clearly take inspiration from it. As you enter the actual Silvermine, the train will take riders past various scenes that depict the miners working. I've also noticed that the silver veins have glittering paint on them, which is such a simple but neat effect. The train then moves into a spinning tunnel, which I believe may be intended to convey that the tunnels are collapsing, but it's a weird narrative trick if so. However, the train then moves briefly through some more caverns before then moving uphill, and here, an effect will make it seem as if the tunnel is collapsing, which is why the spinning effect seems so confusing. It's also worth pointing out that the train moves so slowly that seeing the collapsing effect reset itself essentially renders its peril pointless. After the agonizingly long journey up the hill, you'll witness one final scene in the tunnels as a minecart full of silver is being pulled by a horse. Moving on, the train moves through a now rich Mexican town where you can witness a number of shenanigans occurring. It's clear that while the ride is western themed, a lot of inspiration was taken from Pirates of the Caribbean, not just because it has so many densely packed scenes, but later you can spot a number of figures in similar poses or performing similar gags throughout. However, I will grant the ride credit that the execution of its theme is pretty original and the various scenes are quite interesting. At one point, the train will move past a bull riding competition and move into a tunnel ahead, then transitioning into a man ringing a bell to signal danger to the town. Moving forward, you'll encounter townsfolk being held up by bandits, and as the scene progresses, it becomes clear that they've set fire to the buildings as they begin to raid the merchant's wares. Moving out of the scene, the train then slowly descends through a stonework tunnel and emerges out into a battle consisting of what I believe is either the same bandits, or perhaps a rebellion attacking a fort occupied by the Mexican army. 
I have absolutely no idea if this even relates to the rest of the ride, but I do appreciate a long and complex scene with a lot of different moving elements. To conclude the ride, the train moves through one last rock tunnel and back to the station. Silvermine, which I think is a decent and unique dark ride, if not a strange one, did run until its demolition in 2014, making way for further park expansion and renovation. The next ride that I'm interested in covering is Ghost Rickshaw, which opened with Chinatown in 1981. What makes this attraction different from the others is that it's actually still open at the time of making this video, but because it very much does fit in with the defunct dark rides that I've already covered, I do think it is worth going through and discussing. The ride system is an Omnimover, and while the content of the attraction is based on Chinese mythology and bringing riders into the underworld, it still is very much inspired by the Haunted Mansion. Soon after the riders board, their vehicle will turn backwards and descend under the park which I believe is intended to convey the idea of falling into the underworld. The first scene then presents Yama, a god and judge of the underworld surrounded by his spirits that help determine people's fate. The vehicle then shifts right, showing riders a mountain dwelling inhabited by numerous ghosts. Turning to the left, you can see the aftermath of a forest battle with an underworld warrior having prevailed over a dragon. This then transitions into a graveyard, where you can witness a number of different mischievous gags occurring throughout the scene. Turning back to the right, riders will encounter a sentient tree surrounded by talking busts with projected faces, not unlike in the Haunted Mansion, and moving just past this, dragons can be seen dueling with swords. The vehicles then spin around and reveal a large set with a ghostly ship, crewed by skeletons performing various tasks and sailing through a thunderstorm. I'm unsure if this is related to the ship, but the next scene appears to have figures plundering a treasure hoard. The ride next brings riders up an incline, and on the left, a scene with a god holding up masks can be viewed, though I'm not exactly sure what the context is intended to be. The vehicles keep traveling upwards, moving past hanging bones from the ceiling, and emerge out into a large temple which clearly seems intended to be this ride's equivalent of the Haunted Mansion Ballroom. Here, dancing ghosts will revolve through walls using a Pepper's ghost effect, and numerous figures can be seen playing instruments. Riders will then quickly encounter three figures known as the Hitchhikers, and the ride will proceed through a hall with mirrors, using an illusion to make it seem as if the ghosts have joined you in the vehicle, again, just like the Haunted Mansion. After passing this, the ride will reveal its last scene, where numerous figures are attempting to subdue a large monster by tying it down. From here, riders continue up the incline and return back to the station. Like the other attractions I've covered, I think that while Ghost Rickshaw is inherently interesting, it's still not a particularly well-developed dark ride. While I like that it's inspired by Chinese mythology, it reminds me quite a bit of a few attractions that I've covered in my religious theme parks video, the scenes themselves are very disjointed and don't seem to relate to one another, at least as far as I can determine. Speaking of completely disjointed scenes, I would like now to move on to the park's final attraction we'll be discussing, which is Hollywood Tour. Built in 1990, in what was formerly the Space Center building, this attraction was a boat ride that took visitors through knockoff scenes of various classic films. In the station, riders can catch a glimpse of an Alfred Hitchcock animatronic, and once the boat leaves the station, riders will plummet down a drop barely missing a waterfall that shuts off right before the boat approaches. While the premise of this attraction is clearly based off of Disney's The Great Movie Ride, this first scene in the cave is also extremely similar to Pirates of the Caribbean, if you haven't already picked up on it. Turning the corner and emerging from out of the cave, the boat will pass through a New England town and a fisherman can be spotted with a shark fin nearby. The fisherman then sinks as if attacked, and the boat is attacked by sharks first from the left, and then from the right. Obviously, a lot of inspiration was taken from Jaws from Universal Hollywood's tram tour. After this, riders travel into another cave, and then emerge into a different scene, now inspired by Tarantula. Men in a helicopter fire at the giant Tarantula to no effect, 
and the boat then passes under it, once again moving into a cave. Moving around the bend, the riders will encounter a Sinbad scene which portrays an earthquake. Elements of the structure will unconvincingly collapse, and that's about it. Entering a stone tunnel, the next scene will illuminate, revealing Dr. Frankenstein, his original monster, and his bride, and what appears to be a third corpse in the process of being reanimated. Up above, the monster can be seen again, pushing a woman off of a ledge. After another long portion down a dark tunnel, the boat reaches a scene from 20,000 leagues under the sea, where a diver can be seen exploring a shipwreck in a reef. Nearby, you can also spot a giant squid. This then transitions to a scene based around Tarzan, which is pretty large and elaborate. I think my favorite element is probably the water skiing chimpanzee. Proceeding forward, riders will now encounter Dorothy and her house, having just landed in Oz, with Glinda the Witch of the North making an appearance. The ride then moves to the final scene, depicting New York City as the boat circles around a King Kong animatronic standing in the water as he fends off another boat. To conclude this attraction, the riders travel up a lift hill and return to the station. Hollywood Tour closed in 2020 with the rest of the park during the worldwide shutdown, but the attraction itself never reopened. While well, definitely bizarre and inferior to every scene that has either appeared in a Disney or Universal attraction, I must admit that at the very least, the ride is quite entertaining, even if not particularly well conceived. I hope that this dive into the old dark rides and attractions of Fantasyland was interesting, even if it's not a park that you're particularly familiar with. In my original video where I covered the park in its contemporary state, I did make the comments when covering Ghost Rickshaw that I didn't think that it was particularly good. I can understand how a lot of Germans have nostalgia for attractions like these because I'm sure that many grew up experiencing them, but none of these were really built to last and tended to age poorly. With so many of these attractions also outright ripping scenes and elements directly from Disney and other various parks, I think that Fantasyland has also realized that its true creative potential lies in its own ideas. I don't need to tell you that Black Mamba is an incredibly well-themed coaster, or that the lands of Klugheim and Rookberg aren't absolute top-tier creations. In fact, a sentiment I've shared before is that while Disney and Universal continue to dominate the conversation in terms of theme parks, I find it really refreshing to learn about various European parks that for the most part have been pivoting towards interesting and original ideas, instead of just slapping a movie IP onto everything. I can certainly understand why European parks have taken inspiration from Disney for decades, but as the world has become more connected and Disney has expanded across the globe, it became important for these parks to find their own innovative and original ideas. So I must ask then, were Fantasyland's old attractions bad? Well, I don't think so, but I don't think that they were particularly entertaining either. What makes them interesting is not their content, but rather how catchpenny they were, and that they very much felt like something produced for a fairground ghost train. To be fair, it does appear that many of these attractions aged poorly because of a lack of maintenance, but there were a lot of other fundamental storytelling issues as well, often just slapping scenes together in a way that just didn't feel cohesive. Again, if people grew up loving these rides, I certainly can't fault them for doing so, but I think it only makes sense for the park to move away from them, and I wouldn't be surprised to see Ghost Rickshaw close by the end of the decade. While Fantasyland today is incredibly well themed and has great attractions though, I do think that they should at least entertain the idea of creating more dark rides, because I think that they have definitely proven themselves creatively with how good the newer areas of the park are. So, if you enjoyed this video and stuck with me until the end, and haven't hit the like button, you can do so to help really boost it into the algorithm. As always, if you have not yet subscribed and hit the bell icon, you can do so to be notified to new videos when they're released.